Welcome to the Rare History Channel. 11 Interesting and Bizarre Facts About Meyer Lansky Meyer Lansky, known as the Mobs Accountant, was an American major organized crime figure who, along with his associate Charles Lucky Luciano, was instrumental in the development of the National Crime Syndicate in the United States. Nicknamed also as the genius, Lansky was a visionary, planner, strategist, problem solver and long game player, as described in his biographies. Take a look for interesting and bizarre facts about Meyer Lansky. Fact number one. Lansky's primary career goals after the National Crime Syndicate formation were to develop a foundation for future operations, become indispensable to the conglomerate's mobster members by making them money through gambling and in doing so, keep a low profile and stay mysterious. Once accomplished, which was the case by the 1950s, he pursued further expanding his gambling empire globally. Wealth was not the objective, for of that he had more than enough, nor were the trappings of power, author Hank Messick wrote about Lansky. It was the exercise of power that Lansky enjoyed, to study others, to profit by their mistakes was his technique. Number 2. The gambling enterprises under Lansky's purview included ones he owned solely, some he co-owned in partnerships and others in which he held points, or from which he received a percentage of the skim. He was involved with gambling clubs and dog racetracks in the U.S. states of Florida, Arkansas, Louisiana, New York, Nevada, Kentucky, Mississippi and Alabama along with Cuba, England, the Bahamas, Haiti and Lebanon. In his later years, he was working on developing casinos in Jamaica, the Virgin Islands, Hong Kong, Bogota, Hawaii, and the French Riviera. Number 3. Along with gambling, Lansky was involved in numerous businesses during his lifetime. They included the tool and die, auto repair and modification, murder for hire, bootlegging, narcotics and coin-operated machines businesses. No matter where you went, the mob had its finger in the pie, a mobster wrote about the National Crime Syndicate's growing portfolio of enterprises, and usually it was Meyer Lansky's finger, as recounted by the authors of The Money and the Power. Author Albert Fried wrote in The Rise and Fall of the Jewish Gangster in America that Lansky more than anyone else grasped the emergent possibilities of gangster capitalism. Number 4. Lansky schemed and facilitated the prison release, a pardon by New York Governor Tom Dewey in this case, for Mafia head, Charles Lucky Luciano, in 1946 by helping create and fostering a means by which Luciano could contribute meaningfully to the World War II effort. The opportunity was through Operation Underworld, in which mobsters, under imprisoned Luciano's direction with Lansky as the go-between, controlled and prevented mayhem at New York's ports. Number 5. Lansky secretly turned against and even orchestrated the fall of some fellow National Crime Syndicate members when it suited his purpose, often to eliminate potential competition. It's well known that he approved the murder of his childhood friend and fellow gangster, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, but Lansky also greenlight hits on Abner Langis Willman, another longtime friend and associate, as well as Luciano loyalist, New York mafioso Joe Adonis, born Giuseppe Antonio Dodo. In another example, Lansky betrayed longtime associate, Louis Lepka, Nabuckelter. Four months before Lepka was indicted by a federal grand jury for narcotic smuggling, he went into hiding. Wanting Lepka captured and convicted, Lansky brought about his surrender, through a mediari of course, on the false promise of getting the deal of not being prosecuted by New York State. Lepka later was found guilty and sentenced to 14 years in prison, after which he was convicted of extortion and sentenced to 30 years to life. Number 6. In the 1930s, there were pro-Nazi people in the US who held rallies in support of Nazism. At the secret request of a Jewish New York judge, Jewish mobster Meyer Lansky organized groups of Jewish gangsters and boxers who broke up one rally after another with baseball bats and clubs. Number 7. Lansky allegedly blackmailed J. Edgar Hoover in the 1930s with incriminating sex photos he somehow had obtained of the FBI director and his top deputy Clyde Tolson. The pictures were said to hold at bay this most formidable of potential adversaries, wrote authors Sally Denton and Roger Morris. Number 8. Despite 60 years in the underworld, having committed various crimes and having been arrested many times, Lansky beat six murder charges and only spent three months, 16 days, behind bars, between May and July 1953. 
Number 9. Lansky's best friend, confidant and ally was Vincent Jimmy Blue Eyes Allo, a high-ranking capo in New York's Genovese crime family. Allo and Lansky hit it off from the start, John William Tui wrote. Both were small men, 5'3", and only a year apart in their ages. They were both basically shy men who had crawled out of the almost unbelievable poverty of the New York slums. They were book-loving, low-profile, chain smokers without much to say to those they didn't know. Over the years, Allo had grown to represent Lansky's muscle, a perpetual reminder to the outside world that the reasonable and businesslike Lansky was protected by the Mafia. Number 10. Lansky purchased a resort in the Florida Keys in 1951 for U.S. mobsters to go, hide, and recreate during the Keyfauver Committee's hearings. The Plantation Key Yacht Harbor was located ideally, close enough to yet far enough away from the mainland. Number 11. Lansky moved to Israel in 1970 to spend the rest of his years there, but the country rejected and expelled him. Instead, he returned to and resumed life in Miami Beach, Florida, where he eventually passed away in his sleep at age 80 on January 15, 1983, from lung cancer. His net worth at the time was said to have been $57,000 versus its peak in the late 1960s of $300 million. I wouldn't have lived my life any other way, Lansky told the authors of Meyer Lansky, Mogul of the Mob in 1978. It was in my blood, my character. Environment certainly had something to do with it, but basically my own personality determined my fate. I have nothing on my conscience. I would not change anything.